Okay, hey, we've been talking about faith now for a number of, of weeks. We took a few weeks off because we took a few weeks off during the floods. We had a couple of weeks there where we didn't meet. And uh, so we're kind of just starting to gather back together now. But we've been trying to pick back up this whole area of faith that we've been talking about. And again, let me reiterate, there's nothing new being taught here. But how many of you know that the Christian life is not built on what you know? It's built on what you do with what you know. Yep. It's not about how much Bible knowledge you have or theology you have. The difference doesn't come into your world just because you know something. The difference comes into our world when we begin to on what we know. We begin to live that stuff out. So again, I preface by saying if you're here going, I cannot wait to be dazzled by this incredible intellectual theologian up the front, you will be greatly disappointed. Uh, I'm just going to talk to you about a few things that we find in this collection of ancient documents that we call the Bible. 66 books written over 1,500 years on three different continents by all kinds of people collected together, sustained together by the power of God, even through centuries and nations and places where they wanted to burn it and remove it and get rid of the entire story. Yet here we are, we still got it, and it still speaks to us in 2022. Amen? Awesome. Awesome. Hey, I was, I was downtown. Actually, if you've got a Bible there, can you turn to Luke chapter 6 for me while, I'm, while you're waiting? And just a reminder again, if you're in the middle section and you're on your phone, you better be looking at the Bible because the live stream cameras will pick it up and, uh, and, and it's happened before. So don't get there on Facebook. Someone's going to notice and they're going to call you up on it. No, literally, it happened once. Sitting there nodding, and I'm thinking, yeah, they're really taking this in. And then somebody, I went and watched the thing, and now they've got Facebook up. So anyway. Um, I went downtown. I've been going downtown like many of you have been, and we've been uh, uh, you know, helping out with the cleaning and, and that process downtown and stuff. And one of the places that uh, I've been going to, um, we spent a bit of time there. We were scrubbing mud off the floors. We were ripping things off and so on. And behind the plasterboard is brick. So what's happening in this particular place is they've got brick walls, right? But what they did is they put plasterboard over the brick. And when the floods hit last time, the plasterboard came off and they put plasterboard on again. And this is what they've been doing to make it look kind of, you know, I guess aesthetically nice, whatever. Mind you, the brick looks beautiful. When you take the plasterboard off, the brickwork looks amazing. You, there's amazing things you can do with brick. Um, I digress. But anyway, so what's happened is, is in the course of conversation with them, we've been talking about, so when are the owners coming in and going to rebuild, da 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 And we were in the middle of the conversation, and, and the guy that leases the place said this to me. He said, he said, when they come back, they're not going to put plasterboard back on the walls because plasterboard in a floodplain is probably not the best material to use when you know there's probably going to be more water that's eventually going to come into this place. So they've looked at it now and gone, okay, what are, what are the best materials to use to build so that we're not constantly going through this rigmarole of having to rip down? And, and, and even in the last few weeks, there were some businesses downtown and you saw the building teams were back in there and they're already re-putting plastic and things. And then, unfortunately, two weeks later, what happens? We get more water in there and all that, that material's coming off again for a second time. The point is that, that no matter where you build, you've got to build with the right materials, amen? We've, we've got to, you've, you've got to have good materials and know what are the appropriate and best materials to use if you're going to build. We had this little cupboard, uh, little white three-drawer chest thing that has been sitting in the area, sort of just undercover area at our house, and it's been sitting there. I told Jackie, I think, put it there. She put it there about three months ago. And uh, she sat it there, and I just said, leave it there, I'll take it down to the shed, which is only about, you know, 20 metres from where she put it. Anyway, three months later, it was still sitting there. And that time, I'm a busy man. And uh, pre- well, pre-COVID, keep going, Jack, that's enough. Okay. Any marriage counsellors here? Can I book you? Um, and so what happened was, of course, I went out yesterday, I had some time yesterday, I thought, I'll, I'll do the right thing and I'll take this stuff down the back after three months. And so I went out there, and I went to get it out, and then I tried to open the drawers. And guess what? I can't open the drawers. You know why? Because it flooded under that part of our house, and it was, of course, made of chipboard and all kinds of things, and it's just gone all the way up and now Everything swelled. And so anyway, the next move was I got a hammer and broke it and put it in the bin. Um, but again, you need, the, you need to build with the right materials. Uh, if we're going to build anything that's going to be strong and stand and be sustainable, 
you need to use the right materials. And we, last week we started talking about what are the building materials for building a strong, resilient biblical faith. And those building materials are the Word of God. Uh, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus tells this story. It's a parable about a wise and a foolish builder. And, and you can go throughout the New Testament and you'll see many, many times where this analogy of architecture and building is used to describe your personal world or, or the church as, as a body. And, and here's what Jesus says. He says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. I'll show you what they're like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. And when a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed. And its destruction was complete. Its destruction was complete. Now, Jesus is not teaching here at a Master Builders Association. He's speaking to people about their lives. He's speaking to people about what they're going to build their own life on. What kind of materials are you going to use to build a good, strong life? He wasn't giving a lecture about physical construction. It was all about your life. What are you going to use to build your life? What are you building your life on? What are the materials that you're using to build your life? And the nuts and bolts of the story is this. There's a group of people that heard his words and put it into practice, and they built their house that way. Their house was built on the words of God. This is the teachings, the ethics, the values, what Jesus was all about. The other one, they still heard it, but they didn't go and build using the materials that Jesus handed them. Maybe they thought, oh, well, that sounds really good, that's great. Or maybe they thought that's good for somebody else. Or maybe they thought, I don't need that, I'm unique. You don't understand my life. You don't know my background, I'm different to everybody else. Yeah, but, 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 but. The point is, they both, if I'm looking at two this morning, both of them were sitting in this room right now listening to what I'm saying. They were both sitting there listening to the words of Jesus. Probably both nodding, going, yep, amen, brother, preach it, <laughs> you know. Probably both high-fiving, probably both agreeing. But when they got up and they walked away, one of them actually did something with what they heard. The other one did something with what they heard too. But what they did was disregard it for whatever reasons and didn't put it into practice. That's something, I guess. It's not enough just to hear, is it? If we want to build a strong Christian life, hearing is an important part of it, but there's another part of it, the doing as well. But it's not just about hearing, it's about what we're hearing and what we're listening to in the Jesus is making here, the thing he's stressing here is you need to be listening to what I'm saying. It needs to be what I say that you build your life on. In Acts chapter 17, we've got a story about Berean Christians. And Paul and Silas go to this place called Berea and they preach the gospel there in Berea. And in Acts 17 verse 11 to 12, here's what it says. It says now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. So Paul and Silas, they've been to Thessalonica, they preached the gospel there, and you know what? They had some results. People actually came to faith in Thessalonica. Then they left there, they go to Berea. But Luke makes special mention, the writer of the book of Acts, the first 30 years of church history. Luke makes special mention in his, his, his historical document here, Acts. He says the Bereans were of more noble character than Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. The Bereans were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. Now, if you go back and you look at the story of, of when Paul and Silas went to Thessalonica, then to Berea, and you'd look at it, you ask the question, so what is it that made the Bereans more noble? than the Thessalonians. What is it? Because the results were kind of the same. People came to faith in both. Some prominent people came to faith in both locations. Here's what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, what's he talking about? He's talking about when we went to them, just, just before we went to Berea, we went to Thessalonica. He says, When you guys received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, 
but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Now, here's what's interesting. The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians. That's what Luke writes and records. The only difference between the two I can find is this. It says that when Paul and Silas went there, if you go back and read it, it says that they were persuaded by what Paul and Silas said. They were persuaded by the message these guys preached and they came to faith. That's a good thing. But the Bereans were more noble. in that They heard what Paul and Silas had to say, but they weren't prepared to just believe it just because Paul and Silas said it. They weren't prepared to believe it just because maybe it felt right. They weren't prepared to believe it because maybe it was something they wanted to hear. They weren't prepared to believe it because maybe it, it, it met a need that they had in the moment. They were, they were not prepared to believe it until they went back to what they had, their scriptures, which if you go back and look at it, would have been primarily a majority of what we now call the Old Testament. They kept going back to that to make sure that what the Apostle Paul was saying was actually right. This is the importance that these people placed on what we have in this dusty old book that sits dormant on most people's shelves and barely gets touched. It was so important to them, and to them it was so authoritative that even if Paul the Apostle came and said this, we're going to run it past these ancient documents and we're going to make sure that it back, it's backed up in here and that what Paul and Silas are preaching is actually true. I'm amazed because I think if Paul the Apostle came in here and preached today, how many of us would throw our Bibles aside and not even care? We would just go, that's got to be right. Why? Because Paul said it. It's got to be right because Alan preached it on Sunday. It's got to be right because Fertig said it. It's got to be right because Jack Hayford said it. It's got to be right because Bill Jones or Bob Boo or John Boo said it. It's got to be right because Beth Moore said it. And it's not a dig on any of those individuals. It's not decreasing the value of their teaching gift or their understanding or the way we read things. It, what it's doing is it's lifting above that the high value of the word of God in the life of a disciple. Th th this word is the ultimate authority for life. Jesus' words are the best way to build your life, whether you feel like it, whether it's popular whether it scratches where you itch, whether it's uncomfortable at times. And how many of you know obeying the word of God is uncomfortable at times? Who knows that? Let me tell you something. If God had have sat down with me before he allowed this thing to be published and said, Alan, would you be the editor of the biggest selling book of all time? Would you edit these ancient documents? I would have gone through it and there would be a lot of big red pen marks, I'm telling you right now. There's a lot of stuff in there I don't like. There's a lot of stuff in there where I'd love to sit down with God and say, God, I don't think you quite get it. How arrogant would that be? God, look, I know that, you, I know that you're omniscient and know all things, but within the scope of all things, there's some things you don't know. Well, that's what I say to him every time I disregard what he says and I decide to go my own way. I basically say to God, what would you know, all-knowing one? Yeah. Hey? It's kind of ludicrous, isn't it? It's like my daughter questioning me. What would you know, Dad? No, that's okay. You can question me. I'm not all-knowing. I'm not what I am, all-seeing. So you watch what you do. I can be in all places at one time. It's like Toy Story, that little toy. We see everything. So it's about the importance that they placed. On... Now, here's the difference. When they went to Thessalonica, it says that they were persuaded. They were persuaded by what Paul preached. You know what I've learned about, about, about being persuaded by what a person says? If I can persuade you into something, guess what? Someone can persuade you out of it, can't they? How many of you, how many of you ever been honest? How many of you have ever been persuaded, even theologically, by a preacher about something, and you've gone, that's it, that's how it is, yeah, amen, high five? And then somebody takes the same book and persuades you the other way. And all of a sudden, you're here. How many of you have been persuaded? How many of you have seen people who are persuaded to follow Jesus on the basis of somebody's own personal story? This is just what happened to me. And this will happen to you. You know what? I've, I've been walking with Jesus just over what, 30 years, whatever now. And I'm convinced that, that, that no two pictures are the same. No two pictures are exactly the same. And when somebody stands up and goes, Jesus did this for me, I guarantee he'll do it for you. I, I respectfully go, 
say that because I can't guarantee that he will do it exactly the same for you as what he did for me. Know whether he will, maybe he will, but maybe he won't. But at the end of the day, don't put your faith in what I'm saying. Let's get into these ancient documents and let's make sure that our faith is founded in something that's a lot more solid than my words. Find it in the words of Jesus. Find it in the words of Jesus. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing these guys were more noble-minded because they went into the Scriptures and they made sure that what they heard Paul saying was actually true. So just a couple of quick thoughts I want to give you. That we could, things we can learn about building a strong Christian life from the Bereans and the way they approach the Word of God. And here's very simply, number one, you actually need to receive God's Word, not just listen to it. You need to receive God's Word, not simply listen to it. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you here today just simply to listen to God's Word? Or did you walk in here this morning with a heart posture that said, I'm ready to receive? I'm ready to receive. I'm open. I'm not closed. Look at, what, look at what Luke says. He says that they received the message with great eagerness. These Bereans received the message with great eagerness. That word eagerness, it literally means zeal and eagerness. It means readiness of mind. In other words, there was a, a heart and a mind posture when they came before the word of God and they were open. How many times have you come before the preaching of the word or, or a book? or what, You've come before it and you come with a closed posture. Maybe because you're angry. Maybe because you're frustrated. Maybe because the preacher said something last week you did, so now you, your posture is closed. You're listening, but you're certainly not receiving anything. You're angry at God because you didn't get what you wanted. So next time you open up that word, you, you open it up, you're listening, but your posture is one of closeness and hardness towards God, thinking that, well, God will just force it upon you. God won't force anything upon you. As a matter of fact, if you ever have a spirit force anything upon you, that's not the Holy Spirit. God doesn't force himself upon us. He says they received the message with, eager, with great eagerness, with a readiness of mind. Now, some people come in and they're not receiving with eagerness. As a matter of fact, some people come to church on a Sunday and they're actually looking for bullets to put in their gun to shoot back at me at the end of the service. I've had it before. I, I, I've had people come. I remember me only came here for a few weeks, but I could tell the whole time I'm preaching, I'm under pressure, I'm sweating up here going, I better get every word right, every scripture reference right, everything, because I know what he's going to do. As soon as I didn't, I'd see him pull up the barrel and go, got one, got one, <laughs> got one. And then before he got out the door, oh, by the way, can I have a quick chat with you? I'm like, <laughs> so that's all you got out of everything that was shared today. That's what you walk away with. The couple of things that you don't agree with. Or the, couple of, or, or, or the fact that maybe I said it was in 6 when it was Mark 6. And I've done that before, trust me. Most of you have never picked it up once. <laughs> I pick it up because I go back and watch the recording and go, that's not that passage. What's this guy on about? Oh, hang on, that was me. Who wrote my notes? Me. Why didn't I stick to my notes? Because it's me. So some people aren't sitting there with an openness willing to receive. Some people are just looking for things to throw out. They come with a cynical attitude. They come with, with, with a, 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 an attitude not to, to receive, not to be open, not to eat, eat, spit out the bones, so to speak, but actually come with a very closed and critical spirit before the Word of God. Maybe, maybe you're like that. Maybe you know someone like that. Maybe you've been like that at seasons in your life. If I'm brutally honest, I've been like that at seasons in my life. Maybe that preacher said something once and I didn't like what he said, and so I'm closed off to him for the rest of my life. Yet maybe there's something great in what he's preaching, and the Holy Spirit wants to use that to, to, to bring some blessing and change into my world. But because what, you, know, you realize he said this once, back in 1972, back in 72, he said this. Never listen to him again. Well, hey, he said it back in 72. Maybe he's changed his mind. You know, I'm, 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 we're not like that with each other. You know? Oh, Daniel, he played a wrong note back in 90... When was that? I don't know. I can't remember. Played a wrong note. I'm not going to see none of his worship anymore. He hit a G and not a C. Ah, Daniel's leading. I'm not going there. Forget it. And we can be so petty, can't we? We can be so petty. But, why, but really, it doesn't come back to whether you're perfect. Is your preaching perfect? Is your worship leading perfect? Is your advice perfect? It, it's, it's a posturing of my heart. Rick Joyner once said this, he said, if you ever find a preacher who you agree 100% with everything they say, it's only because you share exactly the same heresies that they've got. 
And I think that's completely right. Well done. So I, I, I meet a preacher and I think that I agree with absolutely everything he says or she says and I love it. I don't get all uppity and go, wow, yeah, we've nailed it together. I go, oh, no, you've got the same faults in you that I do. I just don't know what they are, but I guarantee you they're there. You've got the same messed up theology as me in some places. I just don't know what it is because I'm messed up too. But how do you receive? How do you approach the word of God? Do you come with an open heart to actually receive what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you? On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell and it says that they all spoke in other tongues, right? I don't care about the theology of tongues. Don't sit there and jump up or don't come up to me afterwards and go, do you believe in tongues? Don't do it. I'm not interested in that argument. What I'm saying is this. What interests me the most is that there were people there from all the nations of the earth. And what did they say? We hear them speaking in our languages. In other words, the Holy Spirit made sure that he spoke to each individual in a language they understood. And I believe on a Sunday morning that's what happens. I'm amazed sometimes when someone comes up to me after church and goes, oh, when you said this, that was amazing. And I'm like, I never said that. <laughs> what? You got that? You got what? Out? What? Were you listening to me or did you have a podcast on while I was preaching? But the good news is they were listening to what the Holy Spirit was saying to them and they maybe came with an attitude and openness to actually receive what the Holy Spirit had for them. No, no preacher's ever going to be perfect. And if you come to church on Sunday and, and chase around your favourite preachers, well, all you're going to end up with is the same theological defects they've got. But if you come with an openness to receive the Word of God and listen to what the Spirit has to say to you, then you can be like the brands of noble character and it's the first step towards building a really strong Christian life. So be open and receive You've got to receive. James 1.21, James says this. He says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept. In, in some translations, it's that same word, receive. And humbly accept or receive the word planted in you which can save you. It's not just a case of coming and sitting and listening. We have a posture, an open heart to actually receive. Otherwise, if you're just listening, you're missing the point. We're told and taught in the word of God. These writers said you've got to receive. Receiving means that you've got a part to play in that. What's your part? What does receiving mean to you? What have you got to do to posture yourself to be able to receive what God wants to say? Second thing you need to do is you need to examine God's word just like the Bereans did. It says, and they examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Not to find an argument against him. They're not going in there to find an argument against him. They were just going in there saying the overall premise of what he's preaching is that true. How many, of you, how, many, how many of you know that one thing that... that, that one, one, one problem with Western preaching, actually I won't say Western preaching, preaching in general, is we've got to be very careful as, as preachers, and I'm not just talking about people with microphones, I'm talking about you when you sit there with your friends and you want to discuss who God is and how he operates in that. Don't cherry pick your favourite passages. Don't cherry pick the bits you like. So many people have fallen over theologically because they cherry pick. They grab one passage. Say, for example, he, uh, you know, uh, by stripes I'm healed. And they cherry pick that. And then they run around telling everybody, you're already healed. You just got to believe. Which, of course, means if you're not healed, it's because you didn't have enough faith. You didn't believe. It's all your fault. And we get these theologies thrown out. Malachi. Bring it to the storehouse and the windows of heaven will be opened. Hey, I'm not, I believe in healing with my whole heart. I've seen many, many miracles, prayed for many people. We've seen amazing miracles in our, in our short time of walking with the Lord. So I believe in healing. But do I believe that that verse means everyone is automatically healed? No, I don't. I believe in giving and I believe in tithing and I believe that God blesses us financially and can open windows. But, but, but do I believe if you don't bring all your tithe to your particular storehouse, whatever that storehouse is, a lot of theologians are still up in arms about what that. But if you don't do that, God will not bless you financially. I've had preachers say, if you give 9%, it's not enough. God won't bless you. I'm scratching my head going, really? What if I give nine and a half? Now, there's no grace. Just this is the way it is. Well, I'm so glad th that I call out to my God, who was a God of grace and mercy. And I'm so glad that quite often in my life I have not had it all together and I haven't had the formulas right and I haven't had all the principles right and there have been times where my heart's probably even been a little few, but by grace and mercy God has blessed me and looked after me and taken care of me. Amen? But they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They built it on what was recorded in the scriptures. They didn't build it on what some, their favourite preacher said. They didn't build it on what the most topical uh, book of the day was. They didn't 
build it on whatever popular culture said is now acceptable for followers of Jesus. You know, we've got this movement in, in at the moment um, where we're moving away from once upon a time, Orthodox Christian faith has always had the stance that, that this here uh, is, is God-breathed. Timothy says all scripture is God-breathed and given. To us. In other words, God, God moved upon the hearts of people who then wrote down uh, what, what, what the Holy Spirit was impressing upon them, and they wrote it down with their own personality and so on. They weren't robots. That's why you get things like Paul in one of his letters going, oh, by the way, when you come bring me my jacket, it's winter and I'm getting cold. And you go, Holy Spirit, really? Do you think I needed to know that? But, but, but they wrote. But they wrote as the Holy Spirit moved upon them. That's, that's the point. That's what we believe with this. Once upon a time, for hundreds and hundreds of, ortho, of, of years, thousands of years of Orthodox Christianity, we believed that. Now we've got movements in Christianity that go, well, hang on a second, if we believe that, there's becoming this culture clash, isn't there? Where culture's going here, and the word of, but the Word of God's here. And so culture is moving. So what do we do? Well, here's what we do. We now say it's not, uh, it's not the Word of God written down by man. Now what we say is this is the word of man written about God. So now all of a sudden these people weren't necessarily moved by the Holy Spirit. They were just people that understood about God and knew God and met Jesus. But they weren't, they weren't moved by the Spirit as they penned these. This was just them sitting down as if, like you might after church, go and write your own thoughts about a rise church. That's what they're now saying. And if it's only man's thoughts about God, then it doesn't have as much authority, does it? But if it really is the word of God moved upon the hearts of people, if it's the word of God written down by man, it's the word of God. But we've got this subtle shift happening in culture. Why? Well, because there are certain things in the word of God, ways that we're called to live and things we're called to believe and so on, that society is getting further and further away from it. So rather than have the gap here, we know society and culture ain't changing. So let's just keep changing the word of God so we can keep up with it. But these guys would never have done that. They went back to the word of God. They said, no, 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 there's a delineation mark here. This is who God is. This is what the Messiah is going to be like. This, this is who we are, and so on and so forth. And, and, and we, can't, we can't move the boundary because we want to make our life a little more easier, a little more comfortable, a little more safe. Uh, we, we, we're committed to this. They placed such emphasis on the authority of scriptures that they made sure Paul was agreeing with them before they accepted his teaching as true. Think about that. They made sure that Paul agreed with this. Not, I'm going to find stuff in here that, that makes it agree with Paul and then we'll put Paul as the center point of our faith. No, no, no. Paul, you're a great man. You've had a great uh, move of God in your heart and you're a wonderful theologian, probably the greatest theologian that ever lived. But still, Paul, we're going to go back to these ancient writings. We're going to make sure that what you say fits around that because the center point of our faith is not your teachings, Paul. The center point of my faith is the word of God. And on that foundation only will I build the kind of house that Jesus said, this one don't come tumbling down in a storm. This one stands, test of time. And sometimes culture, culture can impact the way that we view things and the way that we see things. Anyway, moving on. Thirdly, you need to act on God's word. So we need to receive his word, we need to examine his word, but then we need to act on it. We need to do something. James has this amazing thing to say in James chapter 2, verse 22. And, and James, he talks about all these great heroes of the faith, doesn't he? And these people did this, and they did that, and they did that. This verse jumps out at me every single time I read it. James 2, 22. It says, you see, this is speaking of Abraham, you see that his faith and his actions were what? So what was working together? Faith and action. So what he believed and what he did. They were working together. Watch what he says. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And what was the result of that? His faith was made what? Complete by what he did. Isn't that an interesting thought? You could be sitting here right now with an incomplete faith. Well, what are you talking about? I believe. I, hang on. I'm not questioning that you believe what you believe. But are you acting on it? Are you acting on it? Are you living it out? Is it the material you're using when you get into those situations that you need to make decisions and take action steps and do things in life, respond to people and so on? Are you taking your cues from what you believe or are you doing something different? Which is exactly what Jesus was talking about with these guys that sat there, heard the words of Jesus, went and built a house, but didn't do what he said. And the house came down. Same thing. 
they're listening, they're amening, they're hiving, they're saying, yep, this is right, we believe, we believe, we believe. But even the demons believe and tremble because they're not committed to submitting themselves to the words of Jesus, the word of God, and living that way. So they believe, but they don't back it up with their actions. And so what he's saying here is that if you want complete faith, complete faith is a combination of believing the right things and then doing the right things. And then your faith is a complete faith. Faith is not complete just because you know theologically and the Hebrew and the Greek and everything to do with that topic and probably write a 500-volume novel on it and preach at a Bible college for a year on the one topic. Your faith is not complete until you put legs to it and you actually go and do something with what it is that you say you believe. Hey, I believe that uh, if someone offends me, I go to my brother and talk to them. Matthew 18, I think it is Jesus. I believe that. No, you, you, you say you believe it, but do you do it? Do you do it? When somebody offends you, do you go to that person and go, well, this is what Jesus said. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. I, it's, it's not natural. But this is the way Jesus said to live. A lot of the way Jesus says to live is unnatural. Until you start doing it a few times, then it becomes natural, doesn't it? Just about anything you do for the first time is unnatural. But you do it a few times, it becomes natural. I used to dress like a dag. <laughs> now I dress really cool. Look at me. I'm hip. I'm fab. I'm groovy. And it's natural. But once upon a time, it was really unnatural. You should be amening. <laughs> so you've got to act on God's word. Ask yourself this question. Is your faith complete or incomplete? You have a complete faith or an incomplete faith? Next time I want to gossip about that person, am I going to sit down? Or, or, or no, Jesus said, gossip. Am I just going to sit there and go, you know what? I can't engage in this. I'm sorry. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. I, I, I don't want to lose a friendship, whatever, but I just need to be honest that that's not the building material I want to use to build my life. So have you talked to that person? No? No. Well, I'd rather not sit here and have you give it to me. Forgiveness. Ah, tough to extend forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's one thing to have the whole theology of forgiveness and the importance of forgiveness and the impact it has on your world and other people. It's, it's one thing to know all of that, and that's awesome. But is there un- Isn't it? When, when we start talking about bringing some completeness to our faith, and this is what he's saying. He's saying when faith and actions combine, you've got a complete faith happening there. And we're talking about faith. Today we're talking about the building blocks of faith being the word of God. That's what we build with. But if I, if I, if I could say that the, the foundation of faith is the character and nature of God, we build with the word of God. I guess the roof of that whole thing is obedience. It's obedience. That's how we complete our faith. And I wonder, sitting here this morning, is there anybody here going, you know what, I, based on that, I don't know that I have complete faith. Well, it's not too late. It's never too late to start to bring completion to your faith. It's never too late to start to do what Jesus says to do in your marriage. It's never too late. It's never too late to start to do uh, what Jesus says to do in the way you treat your kids. It's never too late. It's never too late to go back to work on Monday and start being the employee the way that the Word of God teaches you to do. Do everything you do as unto the Lord. But it's never too late to start that. It's never too late to to, to bring your mouth and your speech under the dominion of Christ and go, okay, what does this word say about, you know, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, only that which edifies. Like, it's it's never too late to get a hold of any area of your life and go, okay, I'm going to start to bring some completeness to my life. Actually doing what God says. It's never, ever, ever, ever too late in any area of your life. It's a decision away. It's a hard decision, but it's a decision away. It's a decision away. You go back to Luke 6, I'll finish with this. It's kind of unfortunate that um, we live in a day and age where we hear a lot of preaching that goes like this. If you'll do A, B, C, right? Then you can avoid the the temptations, the pressures. You can avoid the dramas of life. You can avoid the pain of life. You can avoid suffering. There's this thinking in some Christian spaces that if we just get it all right, we can live a life that's pain-free, that's devoid of suffering, that's devoid... I don't know how we come to those conclusions unless we take a large portion of the Word of God out and cherry-pick our favourite passages. 
It's interesting here, Jesus talks about the two people that built a house. Guess what? They both built a house. They both heard the words of Jesus. They both went out and built something with materials. One of them used a good material. One did their own thing. One house stood, one house fell. Both houses had a flood come against them. Both of them did. You build in a floodplain. Guess what? It's going to flood. I don't care what materials you use downtown there right now. We could rebuild the city with the best of materials. Guess what? None of the materials themselves are going to change the water coming in. And you can build your life on the word of God and be obedient and do everything the word of God says, but it's not a guarantee that flood waters won't come into your world. As a matter of fact, Jesus preempts and tries to get us to understand straight away, hey, this guy built well. This guy used my word. This guy did what I said. But guess what? The storm still came. So building with the right materials does not nullify the storms of life. But what it does do is it gives you the opportunity to stand through them and to still be there when the wind dies down and the water goes down and so on. So my question to you, what value do you place on this? How important is this to you? Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus said, the words I speak to you are spirit in their life. Hebrews 4 tells us that the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Jesus said that that, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It starts with abiding in his word. How important is this word to you? Because if I could do an importance of the Bible gamometer thing, you know, I can tell you that the value you place on this would be a great reflection of where your faith is really at. And how strong your life is being built in Jesus. Amen? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Jesus begins the whole thing, doesn't he? With the whole point of the whole parable. 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And not do the things I say. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. I, I just pray for each person here, Lord. I pray for myself as well, God. I, I pray, Lord, that you would be people that would build our life with the right materials. God, that we would build our life on the Word of God. That, Father, those moments where we take the easy road, maybe. God, those moments where we lay down our convictions for whatever seems the most convenient in the moment. I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you tweak our hearts? Would you speak to us in those moments? Would you call us to something better? Lord, would you let us know every time we do that, we're putting plasterboard up in a floodplain, floodplain. And it's going to get damaged and it's going to come down and it's going to be more work than is necessary. But if we would just build with the right materials, then we can build something really, really strong that stands. Lord, I pray every person in this room as we leave this place this morning, Holy Spirit, would you hold us to the value of the word? Holy Spirit, don't let us get up and walk away and just get excited about lunch and pizzas and whatever else is going on or chicken or the footy or whatever. But Lord, I pray that in our hearts we would dwell and we would think. Because Lord, I know a lot of people in this room and I know that we want to be more noble-minded. I know we want to be like those Bereans. I know that we want a strong and complete faith. I know that we want a faith that's resilient, that doesn't come crumbling down every time there's pressure or something that doesn't feel good. So Holy Spirit, keep doing the work in our hearts that you're doing. And Lord, for the next seven days when we leave this place, God, there are so many people in our community who do not know you, don't know the story of Jesus, don't know the relevance, don't know the impact that it can have on their world. So Father, I pray for each person here that's walking with you, each person in this room that's bowed their knees to Jesus, I pray, Lord, would you give them the opportunity this week to tell somebody about the goodness of God, somebody that up to this point doesn't understand it and doesn't know it. Let us tell them about the great work of Jesus on that cross, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 God bless you guys.